Welcome to this first video in a video series on our successful future. In this video I will be dealing with the introduction and summarize some of the results. The entire video series is about asking questions and trying to answer them that deal with our sustainable future, sustainable development into the future with well-being for everybody. Now, I'm Andreas Pfennig, I'm Professor of Chemical Engineering at the University of Liège in Belgium. But before I start, so to speak, I should first well, motivate, so to speak, why I have recorded this video series. Well, I started a little bit more than 10 years ago to consider things about sustainability and set up some balances in order to understand the data and the statements that were made on the media. I try to understand what they mean for us, for me personally, and based on that I developed a certain insight into interrelations which I think are quite important and I would like to share them with you. From that developed this video series. And well this I will explain in this first video so to speak not only just the introduction but also give an overview over what to expect and then summarize some very few results, a very brief summary. There's a much longer uh, section, a video on conclusions uh, in this video series. Now before I start that, let me first introduce myself. I studied chemical engineering in Aachen in Germany, then went to Berkeley to John Prousness for roughly one and a half years. After that did my PhD again in Aachen, uh, then did my habilitation, which is one way to, on the pathway to become a professor in, in Darmstadt. So uh, that is a bigger thesis that you write, so to speak, that's typical for Germany. Um, then in, two th uh, in 1995 I became full professor in Aachen. Then for three years moved to Graz and now since more than four years where I'm recording this video I am working at the University of Liège. From the considerations about sustainability some publications resulted which are mostly available in scientific journals a little bit more than 10 years ago, these were the first things, then together mainly with Philipp Frenzel and some others, um, publications on exergy as a means to characterize en energy, that's a special thermodynamic property, so to speak, this exergy, that will also be discussed in one of the videos. Uh, and then in 2018, so this year, beginning of this year where I'm recording the videos, I wrote a book uh, that was published, it's in, in German, and I will also mention that at the end of this video very briefly. Now what to expect from the videos? Here is an overview. So first of all we start with this video, Introduction and Summary. Then I would like to work a little bit on, or uh, tell a little bit about world population, which is the driver behind everything. Doubling the world population means doubling the resource consumption, so we need to talk about that. So that is the driving force behind, behind everything. Then we realized in order to reach the climate goals we need to go for sustainable energy transition. The climate goals define how fast that has to happen, so that defines the time scale, so we also need to consider that in some detail. Then we realized that we also need to shift with respect to biomaterials, also production of materials from biomass for example, instead of from uh, fossil resources, same with the energy, also bioenergy is an issue of course. That of, com of course competes with the land area, the same land area on which we are producing our food, so it's food versus bioeconomy. The hunger, actually the world hunger being a limiting criterion for selecting the corresponding technology. So we also need to consider that. Based on these things we got some insight into how things relate and in, before that background, I would like to discuss the recently published IPCC scenarios, actually the so-called illustrative model pathways in the IPCC uh, publication on 1.5 degree climate goal. Uh, and I will show that actually these model pathways that are presented are infeasible. We cannot reach them. It's impossible more or less and I would like to work that out. That doesn't mean that we can't manage the uh, energy transition, the sustainable energy transition, but it can't go the way the IPCC is telling us. That simply doesn't work. I will explain in detail and show why that is so. Then I will talk indeed about this exergy to quantify energy. If you don't like physics, skip this video. Then I will talk about the bio or CO2 economy, where we want to produce from biomass or carbon dioxide, for example, recovered from the air, 
we want to build fuels or materials, I will discuss the options that we have, if that's possible, what are the limiting factors, what are the chances and challenges, challenges especially of bioeconomy, I'll discuss that. And then I conclude, so to speak, talking, summarizing the individual and political consequences. That is a little bit a lengthy discussion because all the side effects you will see, it's, a, it's not a simple picture, but the interrelations actually are quite clear. They have been worked out in these first videos. Here we put everything together and see, have a look at the entire system more or less. In this more technical um, series or sequence of videos, I assume that we are entities, we are beings that have a free will and that consciously choose what to do implying also that we are responsible for what we are doing. And of course that needs to be discussed as well. Why is that so? Is that so first of all? And why is that so? And that I would like to work out in these four videos that deal with the physical basis, then discuss causality, consciousness, conscious choices, and finally free will and why we are responsible. So that is more or less the basis, so to speak, for that. But I think the technical things should go first. And possibly if you're interested in more philosophical aspects, you're invited, of course, to view these last videos as well. Where are all these videos available? They are available on YouTube. I could give you this cryptic uh, playlist name, but it's the easiest thing is to go to YouTube, search for my name and sustainability, then you will wind up with the, my playlist on this issue quite easily and that then you, you got it and can have a look. Now that's more or less the formal part. Now let's look at a little bit more content. Why do we need to deal with these issues at all? Well, the first insight is that the global mean temperature, so the average temperature of this planet Earth, has been increasing. In pre-industrial times, the temperature has been quite constant for extended periods of time, but we see that during the last 20, 30 years, the colors change from bluish to reddish and yellow, and that means that the temperature increases. The temperature temperature scale is uh, given here. So previously we were somewhere in that range. So of course there was always some fluctuations, but it was more or less around zero. And then currently we are now in the range of plus one degree centigrade. Global temperature increase, global mean temperature increase with respect to the pre-industrial level. And we know already now that the consequences are quite dramatic. So we reached roughly one degree centigrade above pre-industrial and we know that we have significantly stronger and more extreme weather events. Strong rainfall, also tornadoes are getting more frequent, are getting stronger, that is also an issue. Okay, so this of course causes problems because the temperature increase means more water uptake into the atmosphere, which means more energy in the entire atmospheric system that leading to these more extreme weather events already now. How bad can it get? How fast can it get, get worse? And that is shown a little bit here in this diagram. So here we have the concentration of the carbon dioxide, which is the main driver behind the climate change. That's at least more or less agreed wisdom. Uh, in parts per million, ppm for short, it's a volumetric fraction of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere versus time. And we see the data here taken from the climate station or the weather station on Mauna Loa in Hawaii, where the data are published. And these are the uh, smoothed annual data that are published on, on this website. And so they are publicly accessible as all the data I'm using in, in my videos. So you can access all these things and do the calculations for yourself if you like. And we see that this is a linear increase during the last decades actually, where I should say something about the scale here. This is actually a logarithmic scale, but logarithmic with respect to the pre-industrial level of roughly 280 ppm. So starting from 280 ppm, this is a logarithmic scale, which means in turn, if that is a linear slope here, linear curve here, which is extended by this orange line, then that means actually it's an exponential increase, an exponential increase relative to the pre-industrial level. And of course, if we assume that we continue as previously, then it would behave like that. And I include it also from the climate considerations that I use in, my, uh, in the later videos, the temperatures where the different CO2 concentrations correspond to, they coincide with those of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, well, not coincidentally, that has been chosen such, that we are currently at the plus one degree centigrade, go, uh, centigrade uh, global average temperature. In 
15 to 20 years we will reach the plus 1.5 degrees centigrade. A little bit more than 10 years later we will reach the plus 2 degrees and another 10 years later we will be at 2.5 degrees centigrade. If we continue as we did in the past. And if you now look at the warning voices that have actually been uttered during the last decades, which are mentioned down here, so from the, uh, the limits to growth of Meadows from the Club of Rome, several authors actually, uh, then the Global 2000 report in, published in 1980, the Brundtland report, the Kyoto Protocol, and very recently the COP21 Paris Agreement, we see that actually during the last decades all these warning voices didn't induce any significant change in the system. So it's actually to be expected that we continue like that if we don't change. And I will work that out in the end. It's us who have to change. We are the drivers behind everything. Okay, so if you continue like that, it will get worse and it will get worse quite quickly. 2060, that's not so far anymore. And even we see then we are at 2.5 degrees and the 1.5 degrees we will reach in 2040. It's quite close. These things are very close in time. That means it's affecting us. Possibly not you if you are really old and possibly not you, possibly not me anymore with the 2060. Uh, but our children, it's the generation of our children. It's not some distant future, it's happening now actually. Okay, and I would like to specify especially the goals that have been agreed upon internationally in this COP21 Paris Agreement and there the goals have finally been specified explicitly and agreed by many countries. We want to stay well below 2 degrees centigrade on the global mean average temperature relative to the pre-industrial level. So these temperatures are always given with respect to the pre-industrial temperature level. And we even would like to pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees centigrade. So even be better than that. Now in order to understand the interplay between the different parameters and drivers behind that, we need to somehow put them together and do something which is actually not so easy. We have to tell the future. How does this system, this Earth system, our system interacting with all the climate, energy and all these things, how does that develop into the future? Because then we can say, well, what do we need to change today in order to wind up with an acceptable future? Okay, of course we don't look into the glass ball, we want to do it more scientifically, more systematically and there I should explain a little bit what I am doing and put that in relation to other things. Typically what you find in the literature are so-called integrated assessment models or IAM. That is the basis for example for many of the IPCC, the, this International Panel on Climate Change. Um, consortium, so to speak, they use models or they take literature data and literature scenarios that have been obtained with such integrated assessment models. Now integrated assessment models are very detailed. They take many details into account. Re regions, sometimes even nations, rural, ur urban areas, climate, food, stuff, materials use, all these things and how these things can develop. So that are really complex models that we use to describe the development in the into the future. That is required, we need that. But it has significant disadvantages because on the one hand side we need to specify all the interactions on that fine level. So we need to say so to, uh, how energy and consumption, how our development and consumption, how um, development and the number of children, so our population goes, how the, all that relates. We have to specify that somehow. And of course we don't have the parameters. Yeah, nobody ever measured them, so to speak, and especially it's not possible to predict them for the future. So that's one thing. There are many parameters that are required and we can only estimate them in many cases. Not all of them, but some we can only estimate. And secondly, one point with such a complex model is actually that we lose a little bit track what are the main drivers and how do these main drivers influence the big outcome, the big picture, so to speak. And that's actually something we need to an insight we need to gain actually because if I said before that it is us who is relevant, our behavior that is decisive in the end, then we need to understand how we influence the system, how, in, how our individual behavior influences the system overall. And that means of course that we need to gain, get some direct understanding of these interrelations and that's hidden somewhere behind these complex models. So I apparently we need that, but on the other hand side, it's not the right method to make us understand. 
In order to make us understand, we need to take a simpler view. And the viewpoint that I'm taking is to use very simple balances. Very straightforward. And I should directly say the outcome here will be in the end directly comparable to, to that. So whenever these things which have de been developed independently, derived independently, if I'm using those, I always compare them at the end, so to speak, with the IPCC uh, scenarios. They collect them and com condense them, so to speak, I co collect, I compare that to that, and the outcome is more or less always practically identical. The nice thing about balances is, and we will see how that works out, that we directly understand the influence of individual parameters. That's directly visible, this influence. And that's, of course, positive. We, we directly see if we do this, this will happen. And we know why and we understand how that interrelates. On the other hand side, that also leads, in, on, looked at the different, from different angles, so to speak, it, le it leads that we directly realize the main drivers, very easily realize those main drivers. And that's, of course, important because if we are to realize it's us who is important, then we should be able to directly recognize that from these uh, considerations. So it looks a little bit that I'm looking negatively at these integrated assessment models. Not, no, it's not so. We need them. We need to get this detailed insight as well. But I'm a little bit cautious about those models because I, from my background as chemical engineer, I know that it's not always good to have extremely detailed models. This has especially been worked out by Sundmacher and Kienle in a book on chemical engineering, some chemical engineering aspects. They show actually that if they describe a simple process by different models, so simulation tools behind that, and start out with very simple models and then go for more and more complexity, the most complex model, so that is actually best able in principle to describe all the details of the process, that that performs worst. And it is actually significantly off the reality that has been evaluated from experiment. So we know the outcome from experiment and if you do the detailed simulation, the result will not depict reality, unfortunately not. The simplest model is also not the best. We need to refine it a little bit, put in some major influencing uh, complications, so to speak, or details, then we get the best description of reality. And what I want to do, I want, to, so this is the most com complex thing you can do, and I want to shift that, so to speak, in the other direction, a relatively simple approach. It's actually not that bad because I, what I'm doing with the balances, I'm projecting past development into the future. And since we have decades of data available, we are able to project for the next 10, 20, 30 years with quite, reli quite reliably. So I think that that's actually not that bad. And that's what I will be using and show the results based on such things. The balances that I'm setting up always deal with this system. So that is the system I am regarding. Of course, if you are an engineer, you know, first of all, you have to set your control volume. So that's what I'm regarding. This is the overall system I take care of. And how these balances work out, I want to show on the next slides a little bit, just to point out one major aspect that we can gain just as an example to show how simple things actually can be. The example is shown here. This is the world population in billion as a function of time. The source is the United Nations World Population Prospect, the most update, updated revision, the 2017 revision. And they publish data on past population, world population, as well as projections. Past data are shown in red here until here. And then they typically, or in, in some detail, develop this so-called medium variant. So that's the intermediate between the high and the low variant. But actually, that is the variant that they model in all detail, taking countries and development of countries into account. From that, that derives then a high variant and a low variant shown here in red and in green. Everybody more or less uses this medium variant in the scenarios that are possibly derived. I show in the next video on world population, I show that it's actually to be expected that the most probable development will be up here. Now, I will show that really and quantify that why that should be assumed. So I assume that we are somewhere here, possibly even close to the high variant. I will show that. On the other hand side, to put that already directly into some relation, we can look at the so-called illustrative model pathways of this IPCC report on um, 1.5 degree centigrade climate change. There they assume these orange lines as their 
model pathways. And there we see actually that they are much lower than the medium variant, so they are much too optimistic as compared to what I will show that we should expect if we continue as we did in the past. So we should be somewhere here. They say it will be down here, but I, I can show that actually that doesn't make sense. I will show that in the next slide, but that's the uh, next video. But that's not what I want to talk about actually. I wanted to show how easily you can evaluate the balances. And in order to do that, I would like to focus on the past and see what, the, what, what we can learn from the past, so to speak. As a reference here, I want to use 1990. Well, why? That is the reference here for the United Nations Millennium Development Goals that have been published. Actually, we have now substitutes for them, the Sustainable Development Goals, but these Millennium Development Goals, they were, so to speak, the starting point of that. You, the United Nations agreed that compared to 1990, world hunger should be decreased. So that's the reference here. So I use that as well. So if we start from 1990 to today, we realize that world population, if you evaluate the numbers, world population increased by 2.3 billion people. So today there are 2.3 billion people more on this planet Earth as compared to 1990. At the same time, the number of undernourished people has decreased by 200 million people, 0.2 billion people. So overall, we are feeding these more many people additional to compare to 1990 plus the 200 million. Overall, we are thus feeding today 2.5 billion people more sufficiently as compared to 1990. Now we can put the numbers into relation. I hope you didn't forget them. The first thing is since 1990, we, we have additional people fed 2.5 billion people. So that's what we grew and that what we, so to speak, additionally decrease the number of people that are undernourished. Now, unfortunately, population increased by 2.3 billion people. That means that overall only 200 million people or 0.2 billion people less are undernourished as compared to 1990. And there we can directly conclude something from that, obviously. Yeah? So agricultural productivity increased significantly. We are feeding 2.5 billion, billion people more today as compared to 1990. Then that's due to increase in agricultural productivity. So we've gotten better. We improved the technologies, everything. Agriculture is more intense. It's producing significantly more output. But population increase at eight up, yeah, has, has eaten up directly the largest fraction of that, 2.3 billion people less uh, are, we, are we more, so that only 200 million more are being fed well as compared or are less undernourished as compared to 1990. So we see directly that agricultural productivity increased, population increased as well, has eaten up that progress and we wind up only with this little bit of better situation as compared to 1990. And we see that directly. Yeah? So that means we directly see, you directly see it. Decrease that and the situation get, gets better. Of course, we can simply take, take the population growth as given, more or less. But of course, it relates to us who are producing babies, who are producing children. Yeah? So if we decrease that a little bit, it's our choice, more or less, we can decrease that number and we will in decrease hunger in the world significantly. You see how big the numbers are. If, if we would decrease that only a little bit, this number would be much, much bigger. And keeping in mind that at the moment still 800 million people are starving, are undernourished globally, and it, it's now, it's on this globe at this moment in time, then of course we have a big challenge. 800 million people undernourished, that's a big number. Yeah? And it really relates to us at this moment in time. So that we directly see how easy it is to gain some deeper insight into um, the behavior of the system, just looking at some simple balances and some simple numbers. Now I would like to focus on some of the results, but only some very small points, because the results themselves are an entire video, just some points, so to speak. First of all, I would like to show this diagram, which will be discussed in more detail in the the video on the on summarizing and on drawing the conclusions. Um, here I draw this triangle where the goal of the for the entire system is to reach a stable, sustainable development for everybody, well-being for everybody, all these things that we would like to, to have for everybody. And we realize actually that it's individual people who are the how should I say the, the, the actors in that game. 
on the on one hand side, it's the individual citizen, so it's me, it's you, everybody of us. It's the politician who is an individual as well, uh, and the, the, we have to realize that. So also the politician wants to be feeding his family, paying the loan for his house, and then we have the company managers who is also an individual. He wants to maximize his income, his earnings, so to speak, and that of his shareholders. So that's also an individual person. If he doesn't succeed with that, he won't be manager for long. Yeah. So. There are certain driving forces behind that. So the politician aims at being re-elected, the manager aims at maximizing the income, and we would like to have a life as convenient as possible. So now you put these three things together and you see the goals are diverging more or less that everybody has. We nevertheless have certain interrelations. I don't work them out in detail, but it shows actually that these individual people are not necessarily, if they live what they are aiming for, they are not necessarily automatically leading to a stable and sustainable development of the entire system. So apparently what we need to do, we need to look at the entire system and take a systems view and see this interplay and then possibly try to optimize that system. So we have to take the systems view. On the other hand side, we have to realize that we are the individual drivers. It's us who elect the politicians. It's us who have the demands which are then supplied by, by industry. So it's us really, our us as individual citizens, who are the drivers behind everything. And that is quite important to realize. We have to rethink our life. We have to rethink our behavior, our choices that we take. Only then we can reach that goal to have a sustainable, sustainable development. And we need to look at the system as a whole not just looking at our profit and our benefit. Also the politicians need, well, they then will automatically need to take that into account because they are elected by us. And if we change our perspective, politicians have to do that as well because we are electing them. And if they don't change, but, but if we change, but they don't, then we, we won't re elect those politicians. Okay, but as I said, I will work that out in more detail in the last video of this more technical part of the of the video series. Now some conclusions. This is the same slide as also as I will also show at the end again in this video on conclusions. What I will be showing is that indeed we will be able to reach the climate goals even with available technology but we need to systematically apply it on a larger scale. More photovoltaics, more wind energy and then it will work out. Of course we then also have to shift the, uh, the, the ne next step so to speak. So the appliances using that available energy like electrical cars, change our heating system of the houses, all that has to be done and realized as well. If we want to reach the climate goals we nevertheless need significantly increase global effort. We need to grow the or increase annually the uh, sustainable energy technologies by 20 to 30 percent if we would reach the climate goals that we have agreed upon and we have to replace the resources annually, the fossil resources annually by 3 percent per year until 2050 if we want to reach the 1.5 degree climate goal. So that are really quantitative numbers. So that, that is a scenario we can take to reach that climate goal or by 2 percent per year until 2070 if you 75 if you want to reach the plus 2 degrees centigrade climate goal. So somewhere in between we should be behaving. I believe that that is actually a little bit above the, that what we can reach. This we can presumably reach. I should say at the moment we are at 0.5 percent of replacement every year of fossil primary energy carriers. So we have to increase that at this rate until we reach this overall a re replacement or substitution rates and keep them up for a significant time. And we have to keep that up over decades, which means we have to be able to maintain that rate of substitution, this annual substitution, even if there are big challenges for our economies, even if there are economic crises that, that may occur due to this very uh, big change that we need to take with all our industries. We nevertheless have to keep that up at that rate if we want to achieve the climate goal. So indeed we need to start now and we have to put significant effort into that. I also will show how much worse things get if we don't start now. This is also shown in the videos. I also show that the food supply is critical but change of individual choices is quite essential. I will show that the number of children is the one of the biggest drivers that we have. 
directly relating to population growth, of course. That is a factor of two easily. And the plant-based versus animal-based food, it's another factor of two that we can save environment, so to speak. So these are the biggest drivers. No other driver is as big as these two. Yeah? So if we change those, it's the easiest way, more or less, to directly get to a sustainable world. No technology, technological improvement or so can manage the same improvement as these, the, or realize the same improvement as these two parameters. I will discuss bio-based or CO2-based materials production and I show that they are feasible, both of them, uh, but not they, the, especially the bio-based um, materials production cannot be solely produced from third generation biomass. I will explain the different generations. Third generation means that we use the waste from the food production, so straw for example, from corn or from, from wheat or from rice. That doesn't, that doesn't suffice in order to supply all the materials that we typically need. Biobase, I should say, is of course competing with food production for the same land area. CO2-based recovers the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and builds materials from that, which works, it can be done, but that actually requires significant amount of energy because the CO2 is at the end, so to speak, of all chemical reactions. You have to pump energy in in order to do something with it, to convert it to some usable materials. The energy for the bio-based uh, economy means, of course, that this, that's the sunlight that is collected by the, by the plants. So there the energy is solar energy. Here we have to put it in from some other technologies that we have. But we don't need agricultural land area for that. So there are drawbacks of both. So they both will compete and at the moment we can't say which will win. One should also say bio-based, we know it works, it has been established to a certain fraction already, CO2-based, that still has to show that it will be economically feasible. I don't say that it is not, but we still don't know, more or less. And there are quite some question marks behind that. Bioenergy, uh, bio on the other hand side, is also directly competing with food production. So this is this discussion, fuel versus food. And we directly re realize that we have to minimize the bioenergy that we use. We need to use it for certain things, for example, for jet fuel, we don't have an alternative than using bio-based liquid fuels. It's the only chance that we have at the moment. Possibly that will change, but at the moment that's only that. And also for some chemical and other processes, we need carbon sources, carbon fuels that we use in the processes. For example, in the steel production, you have to get the carbon in there, otherwise it wouldn't be steel. For example, also in chemical processes, we also need sometimes to burn something for these processes to operate properly. I already mentioned that we need to take the systems view instead of focus of our own interests and our own benefits. That's quite important and we have to understand the interrelation. That's why I'm recording the videos to show a little bit these interrelations. Then we can also reach what I call the developmental tipping point that is possible to reach to, 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 to exceed that, so to speak. If we do not succeed to develop this entire system into sustainability, the climate gets worse, poorer countries will be worse off, that has been shown by the IPCC's uh, study, so to speak, so they will be get in a significantly worse state, which means, of course, then typically what happens is that the fertility, the number of children that are uh, per woman that are produced, so to speak, or generated, they will increase, increasing population growth, making th things even worse. And there we can come into a situation where the more developed countries will not be able to help the less developed countries to overcome this, this limit, so to speak, to develop sufficiently. And then, of course, the entire system won't work anymore and it will only get worse. So that can, can occur in principle as well. Let's hope it does not, but in principle it's possible. I will show on several um, occasions in this video series that we are individually responsible. It's not just a question of politics and technology. They can't solve the issues. It's us who have to solve things because we have, the, as I said before, in the triangle, we, have the, uh, we elect the politicians and we have the demands that are then supplied by industry. So it's us who is responsible in the end for, for all these things. And it has to happen now, otherwise the situation will get bad during our lifetime and that of our children. I mentioned that already and it will really get bad, not just a bit worse, really bad. 2.5 degree climate change, that's horrible. Don't even imagine that. Yeah. So it's really quite soon. With that, that's so to speak the summary. 
Now I would like to mention at least also this book. I don't necessarily recommend that. If you're interested in more philosophical things, you're of course invited to, to buy it and to read it. Um, it's written in German and it's not an easy read. The largest part is about uh, philosophical aspects on free will, why we are responsible, consciousness, a little bit those things that I will show in the last four videos on this, um, in this video series, this more philosophical videos. And only the last two videos actually relate to this uh, sustainable development. That's worked out. All these things are of course worked out in much more detail than is possible in these short videos. Yeah, these are, I don't know, 300 pages of content, so to speak. So that is much more dense and than, than these videos. So you are you're invited to look at that if you're in interested in that. Uh, otherwise, you may just view the videos. And with that, I would like to summarize, so to speak, or conclude with this uh, last slide. Seen from the moon, we can see our Earth rising and we have to realize that this little planet Earth is flying somewhere through the universe and we have to realize that that is all that we got. No more than that. And it's not like if you are at home you are missing some butter or whatever from and you can't knock at your neighbor's door and he will supply that, give it to you. It doesn't work. We can't go anywhere. There is no neighbor. If we are running out of a resource, we can't go to any neighbor, knock at the door. That doesn't work. We are alone and we have to make it somehow on this lonely planet Earth. So we should take care of that system. And with the videos, uh, I hope that I can induce some understanding of the main interactions that are relevant to really manage um, the well-being of everybody on this small little planet Earth. So with that, I'm at the end of this very first video about this introduction to this video series. If you should be interested in one or the other aspects, you are of course invited to view the other videos. For today, I would like to say thank you and I hope to see you again in one of the other videos.